Welcome to Writing Daily, uh, the show where we talk about writing and we work on our stuff together as a group because we got to get our stories done. We got to get our projects done, our manuscripts out into the world and live the writer's life. My name is Devin Galladay. Uh, I am uh, the editor in chief of In the Know Traveler as well as the author of the forthcoming memoir, 10,000 Miles with My Dead Father's Ashes, uh, it's getting close. It's getting scary close. It's getting weird close. Uh, so anyway, welcome, uh, Bob. It's good to see you here. And uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, a, a book called The Things That They Carried. And there's a reason for it. Uh, it's it's kind of a fascinating reading, but I have to, I have to lead up to it a little bit. And by the way, as always, if you like what we're doing, please consider hitting that like button or asking a question or tell me what you're doing in your own writer's life to write more. Uh, and by the way, welcome and thank you very much, Mary Ann and Susan. I hope that you are all doing really well. So anyway, I haven't done this in a kind of a week. Uh, because anyway, everything's kind of coming to a head. Actually, uh, tomorrow I'm going to be doing the pickups for the narration for 10,000 Miles, uh, but that's not what we're talking about today. We are going to talk a little bit about this book called 10, or pardon me, The Things That They Carried by Tim O'Brien. It is absolutely one of my favorites, and the reason why I'm discussing it is because a few weeks back I talked about this book, Zealot, and it's about the story of the life uh, and times of Jesus of Nazareth. I'm not, you know, talking about its validity. That's up for the reader to decide. But the presentation in terms of the writing, normally, because uh, this is sort of like a scholarly work, uh, it is presented as such. There is extensive footnotes in the back of the book, yet the main body of the work doesn't have any footnotes in it whatsoever. And I think that was done by design in order to kind of... Uh, allow the reader to kind of decide whether or not the scholar the scholarship of it was actually accurate and the scholar in in this particular case Reza Aslan presents the book solely as fact he doesn't say this is what I think he just describes here's the scenario and then kind of goes into sort of like way here's here's the you know the the uh, original scripture to where these conclusions come from but he doesn't say, here, I'm citing my different notations to tell you this is the right thing or the wrong thing. He kind of just presents it that this is fact and that's it, even though we're talking about a 2,000-year-old two story. It's, again, this is about Bible stuff. It's just really more about whether or not we have sort of a reason to understand that this is fact or whether this is not fact. He's presenting it solely, 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 as being a factual account. So I want to read this particular book, or at least the first page of it. It's come from one of his short stories called The Things That They Carried. I love it. I want to read maybe the first page of it. Uh, so The Things That They Carried, and I think I need glasses, but that's another story. Uh, First Lieutenant Jimmy Cross carried letters from a girl named Martha, a junior at Mount Sebastian College in New Jersey. They were not love letters, but Lieutenant Cross was hoping, so he kept them folded in plastic at the bottom of his rucksack. In the late afternoon, after a day's march, he would dig his foxhole, wash his hands under a canteen, unwrap the letters, hold them with the, finger tip, with the tips of his fingers and spend the last hour of light pretending. He would imagine romantic camping trips into the White Mountains of New Hampshire. He would sometimes taste the envelope's flaps, knowing her tongue had been there. More than anything, he wanted Martha to love him as he loved her. But the letters were mostly chatty, elusive on the matter of love. She was a virgin he was almost sure. She was an English major at Mount Sebastian, and she wrote beautifully about her professors and classmates and midterm exams, about her respect for Chaucer and her great affection for Virginia Woolf. She often quoted lines of poetry. 
she never mentioned the war, except to say, Jimmy, take care of yourself. The letters weighed 10 ounces. They were signed, Love Martha, but Lieutenant Cross understood that love was only a way of signing and did not mean what he sometimes pretended it meant. At dusk, he would carefully return the letters to his rucksack. Slowly, a bit distracted, he would get up and move among his men, checking the perimeter. Then at full dark, he would return to his hole and watch the night and wonder if Martha was a virgin. Anyway, uh, great stuff. By the way, Thomas, Michael, thank you for being here. And Robin, it's great to see you. So anyway, that's, uh, that's the first page and maybe a, a paragraph of the things that they carry. Now, the reason why I'm kind of contrasting these two books is because you've got sort of like a 2,000-year-old account that is taken completely as fact. And then you have this book that was written about the Vietnam War where you could kind of, without question in my humble opinion, say that uh, I think we know, you know, a, a uh, Lieutenant Jimmy in our lives. And so I would, I would argue that so much of this book is so unbelievably believable that there's no way you couldn't. In other words, he's taking a, a historical event. He's almost certainly writing about real people uh, and giving us reason to believe that these are real people, uh, which I think uh, the writer, uh, Tim O'Brien, does a beautiful job in doing. And at the same time, this book is presented. I don't even know if you can see that. There we go. He is presenting this book as fiction. Why is he doing that? Well, I suppose that there's probably some elements to the book that are not, uh, you know, perfectly fact. Um, and maybe there's some embellishment on things, I suppose. But I think the, the broader spectrum, and, and this is what I'm going to say is important about whether you're writing fact or fiction, is that I think you have to make sure that whatever it is that you're presenting has to have uh, what I would say, not necessarily believability, but something that without question as a reader, like I'm never denying, you know, the story that we're hearing about Jimmy and Martha, uh, and then as he goes on to describe other characters in his story are wholly believable uh, to the point where like, I don't doubt for a question, like maybe they had different names, maybe he's protecting the innocent, maybe he's changing a particular bit of detail here or there, but without question in my mind, these are nonfiction characters. They are uh, believable to the point where describing it as fiction is almost kind of silly. Now, I will say that uh, my take on it as somebody who has not participated in war is looking towards the characters for my factual content. And so one of the things, and I'm, I'm going to share this, is that this particular book, like if you were to look on, on critical comments on uh, on Amazon reviews, which by the way is as dubious at best, uh, there are a number of uh, former military people who served in Vietnam who kind of said, well, you wouldn't say this about a particular war enactment. And they're pointing specifically to uh, their distaste or their critical analysis of the book falls more along the line of what would a sergeant do in a warlike situation in Vietnam? Uh, these are not my experiences. And I would say that those details, um, I, you know, at some point become very subjective, whether or not something might have happened in a particular platoon or not. But my point is, is that when you're talking about great storytelling and when you're talking about great writing, at some point you're getting to the point of that there's something that's happening here that is visceral. And there's something like 2,500, 2,200, 2,300 um, reviews on this particular book. And so what that tells me is whether or not you can debate its accuracy in terms of war 
What you can't debate is that it's something in it that is page turning and inspiring. And the reason why I personally have read it multiple times this is one of my favorite books of all time. I'm sure I'm probably supposed to be doing a better job of selling my own book right now as, as the, the launch is approaching. But as writers, it's something to consider. Do we want to just present something purely as fact, obviously making it uh, nonfiction, or do we want to present as fiction, even though it's quite clear the book is littered with truth and facts? So anyway, that's what I think I've got for today. I've probably talked long enough. Uh, as always, if you like what I've got going on here, please make sure that you hit the like button. It means a, a great deal to me. It lets me know that I'm on the right track. Uh, we're going to be talking more about writing, what's happening in my book, as well as the things that matter to me. Uh, right now, I'm actually working on multiple books. We're going to talk about that more later, uh, maybe tomorrow. Actually, not tomorrow, because I'm going to be doing pickups on uh, the last the last hour and a half of narration on 10,000 miles. It's going to be on Audible. More about that in the future. But all of that said, uh, you know, if you are watching me uh, not live, uh, make sure that you join me on YouTube or iTunes, subscribe, rate, do all that kind of fun stuff. And thank you so, so much for being here. I'll look forward to seeing you guys again real soon. And Bob, Welcome. It's always good to see you. I hope you have enjoyed today's episode. Have a great time, everybody.